Shalom, this is Yitzhak Ruvain speaking to you from just east of Jerusalem today. Today being the 16th day of the month of Elul, 5781, August 24th, 2021. Speaking to you from just east of Jerusalem because I'm not able today to get into Jerusalem for personal reasons, so I am recording today's Temple Talk from my home and I hope the quality will be satisfactory. This coming Shabbat, we read Parshat Kitavo, when you enter. If you recall, last week's Parshat was Kitetze, when you go out. So there's a little poetic balance here. When you come in, come into where? Come into the land. We're going to be talking about that in just a few minutes. Since that it is Elul, I'm just going to take a moment now to blow the shofar, as we do every day of the month of Elul, leading up to the Yom HaTru'ah, the day of the blowing of the shofar, which is Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> Kitavo, it's from Deuteronomy chapter 26, 1, concluding with chapter 29, 8. A beautiful parsha. I want to talk all about it, but first, two other items in the news I'd like to speak about. I posted on Sunday, I believe, on our Facebook page, uh, Smutrich calls for canceling soldiers' trips to Temple Mount. Before I get into this story, which I'd like to talk about, I'd like to mention once again that the Temple Talk is now available on Spotify and on Deezer. And if you are listening to us uh, for the first time, perhaps, uh, you found us on Spotify or Deezer, i uh, just like to introduce I'm Yitzhak Rubin, work for the Temple Institute in Jerusalem. Our website is templeinstitute.org. And we have a Facebook page. We have Twitter we have a YouTube channel, and we have Instagram, and what else do we have? We have our uh, exhibition right in the Old City in Jerusalem, which unfortunately, due to the travel limitations, due to COVID, due to Corona, um, we have no um, tourists from outside of Israel right now coming in. I can't wait till that opens up again so people can come in and see uh, the amazing collection of rebuilt, ready-for-use temple implements that we have in our exhibition. But getting back to Smutrich, Smutrich, Batsalo Smutrich, he's the head of the Relig Religious Zionist Party um, in the Israel Knesset, the Israel Parliament. It's a small party, it's been around for a long time, and he is the current head, and he recently just protested the fact that the army, the IDF, Israel Defense Forces, is planning to bring soldiers to the Temple Mount. I'm not exactly sure what the details of the program, it's been done in the past, but I don't think it's a regular thing, I think it's a new initiative. And he is asking them to not do it. Why? Because he says, and I quote, precisely because of the sanctity of the place, according to Jewish law, there is a severe prohibition against ascending the Temple Mount while impure. Such a trip requires careful rabbinic guidance, and in fact, the chief rabbinate forbids trips to the Temple Mount. Okay, so, uh, and he refers to it as, uh, as the, the plan to bring soldiers there as a field trip. He says the Temple Mount is not a place for field trips. Okay, it's not a place for field trips, correct. I agree with you with, um, with that, uh, Batsalo Smutrich. However, there is sanctity to the to the Temple Mount for sure. That's why when we go up, we go to the mikveh first. We uh, uh, follow other um, uh, laws and customs which guide how we go, where we go, and how we conduct ourselves on the Temple Mount. And the fact that the chief rabbinate forbids trips to the Temple Mount altogether is really an anachronism. Um, their claim for doing so is that we don't know where the temple stood, we don't know where the inner courtyards were, so anybody who goes up is a, a potential uh, danger of uh, potentially violating the sanctity of the place by stepping into areas where we are prohibited from going. I say it's uh, uh, antiquated um, because we do know exactly uh, where the temple stood, we know where the temple courtyards were, and if there is a little wiggle room from here to here, according to different informed opinions, 
um, those those differences of opinion can certainly be observed very easily and readily by everybody that goes up. And um, this concept that we don't know where the temple stood is, again, it's nothing more than an ex excuse. It really has no halachic basis because we do know, in fact, uh, Jews have been going up to the Temple Mount when they have been allowed to by the foreign occupiers since the time of the destruction of the Second Holy Temple 2,000 years ago. We know that Rabbi Akiva went up with a, cup of a number of his compatriots. It's a famous story in the Talmud. And a 16th century a chief rabbi of Jerusalem, uh, the Radbaz, Rabbi David, David ben um, David ben Zimra, um, describes exactly where one can go on the Temple Mount. It's exactly where the Temple stood, according to the same topography, the same buildings, the same structures that exist to this day, because he lived in Jerusalem during the time of. Uh, following the Islamic conquest. So those same those same mosques and, and cupolas and, and other structures that were there in his day are on the mount today. And obviously people in his day, Jews in his day, went up to the mount, which is why he was responding to questions with this information. So we do know where the temple stood. Uh, the fact that the chief rabbinate uh, uh, clings to a prohibition is, is due to uh, internal politics, I would say, inside the Orthodox establishment, and also because it's connected to the government, and the government traditionally for the past 54 years since uh, Israel liber liberated the Temple Mount in 1967, the government has, has been uh, uh, trying to uh, dissuade any Jewish presence on the Temple Mount because as far as the governments of Israel are concerned, it's a, a nuisance, it's a potential... Uh, potential violence, who needs it, as, as uh, Moshe Dayan, who was a defense minister in 1967, said when he officially relinquished a day-to-day -day control of the Temple Mount to the Muslim Waqf, just days after the Six-Day War. He said, who needs this Vatican? Who needs it? He was a secular Jew. He certainly didn't need it. Okay, we need it. Israel needs it. And that is why, precisely why, but Salah Smutrich, IDF soldiers should be allowed, should be encouraged to go up. And in fact, there is a halakha that allows for a, a lessening of the restrictions concerning purity on the Temple Mount when it has to do with ex uh, expressing sovereignty, kibush in Hebrew. Kibush means conquering. And so when soldiers go up onto the Temple Mount, it is a very clear expression of Israeli slash Jewish sovereignty on the Temple Mount. And so it is a very positive, positive uh, expression and a positive thing to happen. And by the way, how are these IDF soldiers to know why they're in the IDF, what they're fighting for, what they're defending, if they are never allowed to go up to the Temple Mount and given proper instruction on what the Temple Mount is, what the Holy Temple is, what it's all about, why we're here, why Jerusalem is holy, Jerusalem is holy because of the temple. And the temple man is holy because that's the place that God chose for his presence to dwell. So it is a, a fantastic initiative to bring soldiers up to the temple mount. And who knows, many of those soldiers might just perhaps, if they aren't already, might perhaps embrace the temple might, might embrace the holy temple, might embrace a return if they are not observant to observing the mitzvot, the commandments. Um, it's such a wonderful initiative and to protest against it uh, for the reason that you're protesting against it, I think is um, very, very myopic, very small-minded. We are encouraging Jews to go up to the Temple Mount, and many more are going up all the time. And they go, and many, I hate to use the word, because I don't like words like secular or religious, because we're all in it together, and some people, some Jews are observant of more commandments, and some Jews are observant of fewer commandments, but every Jew is observant of some commandments. We're all in this together. So I don't like the word secular or religious, but I will say, 
pardon me for using the expression, there are secular Jews that go up to the Temple Mount and they go to the mikveh before they go up because they want the experience. They want to show respect. They want to do it right. So let's give our soldiers that opportunity. In fact, as we all know, King David wanted to build a holy temple. And we know in the book of uh, 2 Samuel that uh, he's told by his prophets uh, that God said, you will not build a temple because you have blood on your hands. You're a man of war. Your son, King Solomon, Shlomo, he will build a holy temple. So, of course, the simple understanding is that King David was a man of war. And uh, he had blood on his hands. He had killed. And God, reasonably enough, uh, did not want his temple built by, by someone who had blood in their hands. Temple, place of peace. And there's a, a, a midrashic understanding, however, that what was the problem here? The problem was that the people, the army that King David led, were fighting they were fighting for the land of Israel. They were fighting for sovereignty, but they weren't fighting for the temple per se because it wasn't in their consciousness because King David had not, had not bothered, had not been aware enough, shall we say, to make sure that every one of his soldiers knew exactly what they were fighting for, that they were fighting for the fact that one day they would build a holy temple and one day God would have a house here amidst his people, just like he's been wanting ever since way back in, in Exodus 25, 8, where God says, and they will build for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among them. He didn't educate his soldiers to that. So they were fighting and dying in battle and, and killing in battle without really knowing the ultimate purpose of why they were fighting. And so that's why God said, King David, you're not going to be the one to build the holy temple. Your son will. And that's why, Betzalel Smutrich, it is so important, so important that our soldiers know what we're fighting for. Whether they're fighting in the border of Aza, in the border of Lebanon, in, 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 in wherever they are, over the border, in Syria. They need to know why we're here, what it's all about. So, uh, all I've got to say is, but Salo Smutrich, I think you are very wrong. Very, very wrong. Uh, today, I think it was just today, maybe yesterday, there was an article in the New York Times of all places uh, describing the um, new reality on the Temple Mounts with Jews praying quietly. Quietly, they say. You know, the New York Times... I'm so glad that they posted this article. That's very good. But the New York Times, as we know, is exceedingly hostile to Israel. Um, very moochy poochy to the Palestinian narrative. And this article that they posted um, is has a lot of uh, misinformation, factual mistakes, uh, and uh, distortions. And, you know, the New York Times, which should really have access to about anybody in Israel who they want to talk to. You would think they're a you know, world-famous news outlet. In this article, they, they interview Ehud Olmert, the disgraced former Israeli prime minister who spent a few years in jail for corruption. Why his opinions about anything today are relevant, certainly about the Temple Mount, why it's relevant at all is... Uh, you know, why of all people to interview him? They also uh, quote, I don't know if it was an interview or they just quote it from the Temple Institute's uh, founder and, and, and head uh, Yisrael Ariel, Rabbi Yisrael Ariel, who they refer as Yisrael Arieli. They couldn't get his name right. Um, it's not such a difficult name. So when you read that article, and we've posted it on our Facebook page, and if you do read it, um, um, just be aware that... Um, uh, there's a lot there that uh, uh, you can question. But um, the good news is that we are still praying on the Temple Mount. More and more people are going up. The police, because they are the police, um, 
it seems to be something that's come, comes with the comes with the territory you know sometimes they're they're more uh they are are more uh, empathetic to uh, Jews praying in the Temple Mount. Sometimes they stop people and take them off the mount for what seem to be ridiculous reasons. But in general, the the trajectory is toward more freedom on the mount. More and more Jews are going out. The numbers are just increasing all the time, and our voice is increasing. And the fact of the matter is that. Uh, the fact that it made to made to the New York Times that we're praying in the Temple Mount gives us here in Israel a little more uh, a little more leverage when we speak. You know, um, even the New York Times had to admit that what they would love to call a a you know an extreme uh, a bunch of a small group of extremists or you know an insignificant number of, of of Jews on the on the edge of the spectrum going up it's not the case at all that uh, more and more Jews from all over the country and from all over the population from right from left from religious from not religious from the cities from the from the farms from the kibbutzim from the villages from from Judea from Samaria from the Negev from the Galil from the Golan men women children ultra orthodox not religious, religious, orthodox, traditional, all kinds of people, they're going up to the Temple Mount and connecting with the Temple Mount because it belongs to all of us. It's God's place. It's God's house. And He has commanded us to be there. God wants our company. And that's the best place to share time and space and prayer and thought and gratitude with Hashem. It's the place He chose. And we should choose to be as near to that place. And if we can't get to it physically, certainly every Jew knows you, when you pray, wherever you are in the world, you face Jerusalem. And if you're in Jerusalem, you face the Temple Mount. And if you're on the Temple Mount, you face the Holy Temple. And then you face the, 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 the place of the Holy of Holies, the most sacred, most holy place, point on earth in our existence. This week's parasha, Kitavo, this week's Torah reading, Kitavo, begins chapter 26, verse 1, the book of Deuteronomy. I'm going to read the first few verses in Hebrew, then in English, Vahaya, Kitavo el ha'aretz asher Hashem elokech noten lecha nahala verishta v'yashavta ba lakachte merishit ko pri ha'adama asher tavi me'aretz lecha asher Hashem elokech noten lach Vesamta vatene, vallach de el amakoma sher yivchar Hashem elokecha, vshachin shmo sham. Uvata el akohen asher yeh bayamim ahem, vamata elav higadati, hayom lashem elokecha, kivati el aretz asher nishba Hashem lavotenu, latet lanu. Okay, I'm going to read it now in English. And it shall be when you come to the land which Hashem your God gives you for an inheritance, and possess it and dwell therein, that you shall take of the first of the fruit of the earth, which you shall bring, which you shall bring of the land of your land that Hashem your God gives you. You shall put it in a basket, and you shall go to the place which Hashem your God shall choose. We were just talking about that place, weren't we? To place his name there, and you shall go to the Kohen, the priest, that shall be in those days, and say to him, I profess this day to Hashem, your God, that I am come to the country, to the land which Hashem swore to our fathers to give us. And the Kohen shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down before the altar of Hashem, your God. Okay, this is the, this is the ceremony of the Bikurim, of the first fruits. Such a beautiful, beautiful description. When you come into the land... Take the first of your fruits and bring them to Hashem. And this, of course, takes place on Shavuot, Festival of Weeks, which, of course, comes seven weeks following the first day of the day of Passover. First day of Passover. And actually, bringing the first fruits uh, can take place all through the summer months. And uh, I think right up through Sukkot. And I think even... There, I think there's even a provision for 
up to Hanukkah, uh, because of course all the first fruits that you're growing uh, in your on your fields or in your gardens or in your orchards may not be ripe and ready to bring on a Shavuot, so you can continue to bring. Um, I think that the the actual ritual that we're describing now is only said on Shavuot. But the person, the, the, the pilgrim, brings the first fruits. How does he know these are his first fruits? Beautifully described in, in uh, the Mishnah of, of Shavuot, um, that, that the farmer or the gardener or the homeowner, he is watching very carefully early spring as his, his, his uh, fruit trees begin to blossom. And the first sign of a fruit, he takes a ribbon and he ties a, a, the ribbon around it so that he'll know when in the, fall, in the coming weeks when it has grown and ripened. He'll know that that was the first and that's the one he will take and place in this tenna. Tenna is a basket, a woven basket traditionally woven of, of, of a reed. Although, as we read again uh, in the Mishnah, there were some people who were wealthy and they would weave also strands of gold into their basket. And that wasn't to show off uh, to their other pilgrims, but their way of, of, of honoring Hashem with the wealth that they had been blessed with. So they're bringing these first fruits and they place them at the foot of the altar and then they say a very beautiful passage which we today say traditionally on Passover uh, and that is this um, little, little uh, history of, of the children of Israel when they left Egypt and it goes like this. And it really begins, okay, let's read from the, uh, verse 4 of chapter 26. And the coin will take the basket from your hand, lay it before the altar of Hashem your God, and you shall call out and say before Hashem your God, an Araman sought to destroy my forefather, and he went down to Egypt and sojourned there with a small number of people, and there he became a great, mighty, and numerous nation. And the Egyptians treated us cruelly and afflicted us, and they imposed hard labor upon us. So we cried out to Hashem, God of our fathers, and Hashem heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression, and so on and so forth. We're telling this little short, brief history, a little synopsis of where we've been. What's it all about? And who is this Aramean? The Aramean is referring to, being referred to as Lavan. Uh, I think in English, Laban, L-A-B-A-N, in Hebrew, Lavan. Of course, he was Yaakov's father-in-law, the father of Rachel and Leah, Rachel and Leah, the two brides of Yaakov. And of course, how did he try to destroy? So harsh, he tried to, dest tried to destroy our forefather, Yaakov? How? I'll tell you how. Now we know that there was, a, there was a tense relationship between Yaakov and Lavan. It wasn't so easy, but in general he was pretty, he was pretty nice. That they got along, you know, they, they worked together, and uh, Yaakov got to stay with him for many years. How did he just, he tried to destroy Yaakov by, he wanted him to stay with him forever. He wanted him to assimilate into his society, into his culture. He wanted him to lose the connection with the land of Israel, with the God of Israel. That was the method of destruction that Lavan was trying to impose upon Yaakov. And of course, uh, there are two ways to destroy the Jewish people, God forbid. One is genocide, the physical destruction of the Jewish people. And we know that's been attempted many times. And the other is to assimilation, the spiritual genocide, really, the spiritual obliteration of the children of Israel. And that, it seems, was what Lavan was trying to do. You know, stay here. We've got good sheep here. The land's good. Your family's here. Stay here. You're going to go back to Israel, and you got your brother waiting there and wants to kill you. You know, why do you want to do that? But Yaakov, uh, after 20 years, uh, took his wife, his children, and his flocks and went back to Israel. 
So again, you have this beautiful ceremony, and I think it's so significant that it opens with uh, when you come into the land. And I have my own understanding of, of what this is all about, what it really signifies. And I guess I say it every year uh, because it's just, to me, it, it means so much. So I'm going to share it right now. We're bringing the first fruit coming into the land. What was the first land, the very first land that man shared with Hashem? Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden. Adam. Adam, the first man. God placed him in the Garden of Eden. And man and God were there together. Just like the reality of the, of the Holy Temple, where God's presence is strongest. And we can be in that Holy Temple. And, 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 and we know that the Holy Temple is built, that the Temple Mount is the place of the Garden of Eden. We know that the altar is the place where the tree of knowledge was, where man first sinned. That's why the altar is there. It's the place where we can mechaper, where we can atone for our sins. We know that the Holy of Holies is where the Tree of Life stood, which is why the Kruvim, the, the Cherubim, are there to guard the Tree of Life. And we also know that Adam was told by God one thing, the fruit of the Tree of Knowledge, don't eat. But we know that Adam ate from it. That was the first fruit. The first fruit that Adam ate from. The tree of knowledge. And we know all the repercussions, right? We know that from that point on, man no longer could dwell in the Garden of Eden with Hashem. And there was this netek. There was this division dividing man and God. And we know that throughout the generations from Avram on, that our, our forefathers and, and Moses and the children of Israel in the desert and up to this day we have been repairing that breach. And so when Israel, when the pilgrims come to the Holy Temple and they're bringing their first fruits, they're saying to Hashem, we're returning what we took from you, we're returning what belongs to you, Hashem, that wasn't ours, that we never should have taken because we never had permission. This is why, by the way, every time we eat a piece of fruit or anything, we make a blessing. We bless Hashem. We thank Hashem for allowing us, for giving us permission to eat from the fruit of the land, from God's bounty. But getting back to our pilgrim, he brings this fruit, he lays it on the altar, and he says, I'm returning, I'm repairing the breach. I am making amends. I am atoning for what Adam Harishon, the first man, did when he ate from the fruit that he was told not to eat from. So, to me, we've come back into the land. And once in the land, we go to that place, the place of the Garden of Eden. And on that very place where we took the fruit that we were forbidden to take, we place our first fruits. And then we recite... The, the, the history of where we've been, what's transpired since those days, and how through it all God has been with us and we're returning and we're back, back in God's presence. We're back in, in God's good graces. And we're back in the place where we belong. To me, that is a very beautiful lesson of the bringing of the first fruits. There's so much beauty in the bringing of the first fruits. There's a description uh, in, the, in the Mishnah, again, uh, about the bringing of the first fruits. And it, and it goes like this. A bull would go before them, the pilgrims, as they're approaching Jerusalem. And its horns would be plated with gold, and it would have an olive wreath around its head. The flute would be played before them until they got close to Jerusalem. Once they got close to Jerusalem, they would send ahead of them a messenger and a and adorn their bikurim, their first fruits. The overseers and the officers and the treasurers would go out to greet them. In accordance with the stature of those coming in would they go. All the artisans of Jerusalem would stand before them and greet them. O oh, brothers from, from so-and-so, come in and come in peace. The flute would continue playing before them until they arrived at the Temple Mount. Once they arrived at the Temple Mount, even Agrippus, the king, and this Agrippus was, was, was the son or the grandson of Herod, but he was a very good man, this Agrippus, 
uh, even Agrippus the king would carry his basket on his shoulder. We have a very beautiful painting of Agrippus uh, the king on our uh, in our um, uh, in the Temple Institute, and of course it's online. Uh, when, uh, he would enter until he reached the courtyard. Once they got to the courtyard, the Levites would speak in song. I will extol you, O Hashem, this is from Psalms 30, um, uh, 30, verse 2. I will extol you, O Hashem, because you have raised me and not allowed my enemies to rejoice over me. So the uh, bringing of the first fruits was a beautiful pageant that took place. And again, why was this so celebrated? I think I might have given the answer. I might have just uh, given the answer to why it was such a, a beautiful, beloved, and 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 and, and celebrated uh, and emphasized a ceremony, one of many, of course, which take place in the Holy Temple and have to do with agriculture. But um, this one, I think, was especially uh, celebrated because of its prime spiritual significance. We are bringing it all back home. We're making amends. We're setting the setting it all straight. We're we're uh, uh, resetting the clock and starting all over again, giving, giving God back what belongs to God, and in turn, receiving God's blessing. Now, this week's parasha, Kitavo, then continues with description of uh, blessings and curses that we are to say, that the tribes were to say on the mounts of Grizim and uh, Har Eval, two mountains that are located right outside of the city of Shechem in the Shomron, in the northern northern Samaria. And uh, the tribes would stand and certain ones would say a blessing and certain would say curses. And this was done after a massive altar was built by Yoshua, and he did build it. We know that from the book of Yoshua, and this ceremony did take place historically at the time. And in fact, that altar still stands uh, in that place, and uh, it's a massive altar, and that altar still stands today. It's a little war-torn after, uh, not war-torn, I say worn, uh, after over 3,000 years, 3,000 some odd years of existence, but um, it's an amazing testimony to the truth of the Torah, and to the truth of our history, and to the fact that we've been in this land observing the Torah for well over 3,000 years, and anybody who says otherwise is a liar. And then, following uh, this description in our parsha is a, a long, long, long uh, passage of curses. First, we hear some blessings. If we follow Hashem's commandments, we hear beautiful blessings. And just like in the book of Leviticus, where we also heard blessings and curses. The blessings are short and sweet, and the curses are long, drawn out, and very painful, very difficult to read even. The fact that 3,000, 4,000 years later, we have actually lived through these curses is even more unbelievable. And again, why the curses? They're not curses. They're not God being angry at us. They are simply... The ramifications, what happens if we don't follow God's commandments, if we don't follow the Torah? These are the results. Things things go bad. Things go haywire. Uh, things fall apart. And a lot of bad things happen. And they snowball and get worse and worse until we can set ourselves straight again and, and pull ourselves together and, and reconnect with Hashem, who's always there throughout all of it to be reconnected with. Until that time, then we've got these curses. Again, it was these curses were, were, were mentioned, different curses, but very similar mentioned in the book of Leviticus because we were on the edge even then of entering into the land. And it was important that we had this information before us then and again now because we're again on the edge of entering, entering into the land. I think I gotta call it quits right now because we are coming to the end of our broadcast, so I just want to thank you all very much for being with me, Temple Talk.